Purdue. Uh, Justin Spock here from uh, the Colster Mound Museum Society is going to do a presentation on the importance of this site. And uh, I'll let him take it away. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am Justin Smack. Um, you're probably wondering, well, why is someone from Cahoke get here in Harrisburg? Uh, well, I am a Harrisburg graduate. I graduated in 2015 and um, worked my way through uh, undergraduate and graduate school and finally got my position here at Cahokia. Yeah. Now, um, I am not a trained archaeologist. Um, I learned from the archaeologists on staff. My forte is museum studies, how museums work and how they function. Um, but I'm also someone who thinks Cahokia Mount I tell them I know enough to be dangerous. So uh, we're located in Collinsville, Illinois. Um, it's just about uh, 15, 20 minutes from downtown St. Louis. Um, and um, so Cahokia Mounds, we like to start with our land acknowledgement statement. Cahokia Mounds State, State Historic Site is on traditional indigenous land. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and its various indigenous stewards spanning multiple generations. Cahokia Mounds is considered the largest pre-Columbian indigenous site north of Mexico. There's nothing like it north of Mexico. It originally covered about 4,000 acres and had roughly 120 mounds. Today, the site is owned by the state of Illinois and it's administered by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And through those entities, we now protect about 2,200 acres and about 72 of what's left of only about... Unfortunately, we did lose some of the mounds to urban and agricultural development. People really liked building their houses on top of the mounds, <laughs> and farmers really liked plowing over them to use extra soil for their fields. The site first started to get popular after the 1904, or during the 1904 World's Fair. People were coming across the river, they were noticing the site, but at that time, they didn't think the mounds were made by other people. They thought they were just part of the natural landscape. They were just always there. Well, in the 1920s, an amateur archaeologist by the name of Warren K. Moorhead decided there was more to the mounds than that. So he started doing some excavating uh, on a mound in the center of the area. And what he was able to determine, uh, well, he found some artifacts, he saw some differentiations in the soil quality and content that told him that this mound was not naturally here. So this was by 1928, by. the site was first protected as a very small state park. Eventually, in 1965, we were designated a United States National Historic Landmark. And then in 1982, we got the designation as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and if you're not familiar with World Heritage Sites, there's a, to there's a total of about 1,500 in globally there are only 24 located within the United States, and there's only one located in Illinois, and that is Cahokia Mounds. I think that's pretty special. Now, the culture that I'm going to talk about today that built Cahokia Mounds, we don't actually know what they called themselves because they left no written language. There's no written language for us to really know who or what they call themselves or who they descended to. So, we call them Mississippians because that's the cultural phase or the time period that they lived in. And to give you a kind of a, an idea of um, that what a cultural phase is, I'm going to kind of briefly talk So the about earliest, this. the first, the Paleo-Indian phase, this is when indigenous peoples came across the um, land bridge um, from Asia continent into Alaska, and then eventually down into the area of Cahokia, which we call the American Bottom, which was created by the movement of glaciers. That's why that area was so important or so sought after towards Native Americans because of the soil quality and the richness that they were able to get from the land. But these people were big game hunters, so they had to constantly move to find their food. They were always following the big game. The next cultural phase is the archaic, and um, what was really special about this phase is that um, fishing really started to be utilized a lot more, and it allowed for settlements to be a little bit more settled. So now they had a little bit more of a constant food source, so they didn't have to follow their food as much. Um, so we're still kind of starting to see it. We're going to start seeing a little bit more settlement. By the time we get to the woodland phase, we really start to see people settling down. Um, and we're also starting to see innovations take place. So the woodland phase, its big marker is um, that's when we start seeing pottery being used quite often, um, is from that area. 
And then we move into the Mississippian phase, which is that cultural phase that we're talking about for Cahokia. It lasted from roughly 750 to 1400, and what sets off the Mississippians is the construction and the um, usage of mounds, um, but also their organization of communities and, and neighborhoods and that sort of thing. Now, the Mississippians that lived at Cahokia, they were there for a roughly 300-year span between, between the years 80, 900, and 1400. We believe that they would have hit their peak population around the year 1050 or 1100, and it's estimated that at anywhere at one time it was between 10 to 20,000 individuals living there at one time. And to, to put that in perspective, in the year 1100, uh, 20,000 individuals would have been larger than the population of London for that time. So it was quite large. Their um, I mentioned their community organization, as you can see in this, this is just a rendering of a painting of what someone thinks it might have looked like at the time. But you can see um, that there were different uh, communities, neighborhood areas, and that's that, that identifying factor of Mississippi. We believe, we believe that the structures that they would have lived in would have been single-family dwellings that were rectangular in shape. They would have had a um, trench, trench wall where they would have dug in a little bit anchored the walls in, and then covered with a um, plaster or clay or a, a wattle and daub, which is clay and grass. Um, and the reason we know that is because... So, uh, there has been know. extensive excavations taking place at Cahokia Mounds. Uh, less than 1% of our site has actually been excavated, and that's primarily because we promote preservation and protection. But we have been able to find quite a bit with just that 1%, or less than 1%. And it's one of those things is of uh, the structures. So here you can see where the soil, so when you, when you dig the soil, it doesn't go back the same way it was. So it changes the composition. And archeologists are able to see a different state <coughs> or different coloration. And they were able to see the blueprint, if you will, of the structure. And then to kind of help orient that structure as well, they found uh, various pits on the outside that would have been used for various different activities, um, fire, storage, maybe as well. It's likely that their roofs would have been made out of thatch. Uh, prairie grass was very common in the area around Cahokia for that time. The Mississippians at Cahokia were an agricultural society. They planted and harvested much of what they ate. But it wasn't just any random plant. They wanted plants that produced a lot of seeds so they could then take those seeds and replant them and keep a surplus going. So uh, corn, we do believe, was their primary source. Uh, corn would have came around, uh, I believe, 900 would have came out of would have came out of Mesoamerica up into eventually up into our area. Corn, squash, lamb's quarter, little barley, pumpkins. Like I said, anything that had a lot of those seeds that they could then take and replant. Now we believe that their crops would have been planted primarily on the north side of the site, so um, on the other the north side of Pahoke, of uh, Monk's Mound. And that's because that soil was um, sandier, and it was a lot um, was easier to cultivate. And that's because uh, some of the tools that they would have been using, it would have been easier for them to cultivate that soft land. Uh, this is an example of a mussel shell gardening hole that I have. I've got pictured up there. Um, we believe this would have been some type of uh, tool that they would have used to till their gardens. It would have been made out of a freshwater mussel shell that we believe would have came from Cahokia Creek which ran along the north side of the site. Um, this is what that would have looked like. So they, there would have been a tool with, um, it's the same motion as if you're making a fire with sticks, and you would rub that stick until you got a hole in the center of your shell, and then they would attach it to the wooden, the wooden handle, and that's how they would have their, their, their hope. Now this would have been sturdy, but it wouldn't have been super sturdy for the hard clay ground that is common in that area, so that's why they went north for that. that that softer soil. Um, we have also found um, stone axe heads as well. This is um, a replica of what we think one would look like. Now, when we find these on site, they like this because the handle it, it, it's faded. It, you know, it doesn't last that long. The, the wood rods. Um, but we do believe this would have been used for some kind of stone axe, and this would have been used to cut their wood and that sort of thing. Now, the t they would have also supplemented their uh, food uh, as well with the wildlife in the area. We believe white-tailed deer would have been the most common just because that's what's most common in this area at the time. But also, when we find animal remains, a lot of the animal remains that we're finding are of white-tailed deer. 
Um, also, they would have had a, a turkey, rabbit, squirrel, largemouth, bass, fox, beaver as well. Pretty much what's common, what we would see now is what, what, we would have, what they would have had then. Now, we believe white-tailed deer would have been another common animal because of the types of weapons that they would have been using. So um, the archaeologists on staff believe that, that the Mississippians at Cahokia didn't necessarily use bow and arrow, but they used a piece called an atlatl. Uh, this is an atlatl, and what they would do is you would take, it was a, an extra, they call it like an extra appendage, and you'd take your spear or your lance, and you'd put it, butt it up to this hook, and then you'd launch it that way. And it was a lot more accurate and a lot more quicker than if you were just throwing that, that spear with your, your arm. Um, and then a lot of times, too, these would have had banner stones, and this would have helped project that or project that, that lance or spear. And the reason we've been able to find some of the atlatls is because a lot of times, some of it was um, made from bone. Some of them are shorter, and they've been made from bone, so they, they actually last a little bit longer. Um, they would have also made um, used a lot of different things from the deer to make weapons or tools. This is an example of a um, deer antler knife. The blade is made out of flint or chert, which is just a, an easy, it's a softer mineral or a rock that you can carve and sharpen. Now, I did mention that the Mississippians had no written language. Uh, so how we're able to know a little bit more about them, their history and culture, actually comes from some of the pottery that's been found at the site. And some of the pottery we found has been in the shapes of animal or people, and we call those effigies. And one that I like to point out is um, the beaver bowl. So this um, is a replica, but the beaver bowl was found um, at Cahokia. And we believe that this tells a little bit more about what the Mississippians would have believed in spiritually. Um, and this kind of plays into the belief in a tripartite cosmos, a belief in an upper, middle, and below world. Because beavers um, lived on land and water, it was believed that they could move in between the two worlds. And so we think that that was a little bit of uh, a leaning towards maybe what the Mississippians would have believed in spiritually. Also, um, what we found at Cahokia are pieces with a cross-like symbol on them, and I've got them pictured here as well. And because of where these were found on site, they were found at our, um, we call it Woodhenge, um, and I'll, I'll mention it later. Uh, we believe this would have been used for some kind of ceremonial purpose. And um, we believe, the, uh, well, the archaeologists believe that that cross symbol on the front would have sim possibly symbolized the cardinal directions, uh, north, south, east, or west. And that makes more sense whenever you, you put it in context with the, the wood hand. Now, another cool thing that the pottery does is it helps us understand Cahokia's reach. So Cahokia Mount was not the only Mississippian site in the United States, you know, in, in the North America. There are actually several different Mississippian sites throughout the United States. There is um, Etowah in Georgia, there's Spyro in Oklahoma, um, and there, the, the Mississippians stretched all the way from the Great Lakes, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, from the eastern edge of the Great Plains, and all the way to the um, Bay Lake. So it's stretched This by pottery far. helps us know their reach because the, a lot of the pottery that is found it's made out of that red, dark brown. It's it's called um, uh, uh, flint clay. Um, it's not an actual clay. It's more of like a rock, like a hard rock. But it's only found in the Ozark regions of Missouri. So that tells us that if we find something made out of this flint, you know, in Etowah in Georgia, then they had to have some kind of connection with Cahokia in some way. Otherwise, how would they gotten that material? So that's another cool thing that we get out of the pottery as well. There are three different types of mounds that we have at Cahokia. The first one and the most common one is the platform mound. They're square at their base and they're flat on top. And we believe those were used to elevate structures. And it wasn't that the Mississippians would have been living in those elevated structures, but it would have been more for communal use buildings, like uh, mortuary buildings um, or, things that, um, or things of that nature. Sweat. Now, another cool thing that the pottery does is it helps us understand Cahokia's reach. So Cahokia Mounds was not the only Mississippian site 
in the United States, you know, in, in the North America. There are actually several different Mississippian sites throughout the United States. There is um, Etowah in Georgia, there's Spiro in Oklahoma, um, and there, the, the Mississippian stretched all the way from the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, from the eastern edge of the Great Plains, and all the way to the um, Bay Lake Dakotas. So it's but quite. this pottery helps us know their reach because the, a lot of the pottery that is found, it's made out of that red, dark brown. It's it's called um, uh, uh, flint clay. Um, it's not an actual clay. It's more of like a rock, like a hard rock. But it's only found in the Ozark regions of Missouri. So that tells us that if we find something made out of this flint, you know, in Etowah in Georgia, then they had to have some kind of connection with Cahokia in some way. Otherwise, how would have they gotten that material? So that's another cool thing that we get out of the pottery as well. There are three different types of mounds that we have at Cahokia. The first one and the most common one is the platform mound. They're square at their base and they're flat on top. And we believe those were used to elevate structures. And it wasn't that the Mississippians would have been living in those elevated structures. But it would have been more for communal use buildings, like uh, mortuary buildings um, or, things that, um, or things of that nature, sweat lodges. Um, there are conical mounds. These mounds are around at their base. They come up to a point. And these are the ones that we um, connect with burial. So not every mound at Cahokia would have been used for burial. Those we do believe were, based on evidence at our site and also at other Mississippian sites. The third type is actually unique to our site. We only have six of these uh, ridge top mounds in, in total at Cahokia. They're longer than they are wide and they come up to a point, and that's kind of where we get the name ridge top. Now, we weren't entirely sure what those might have been used for, but archaeologists believe that they would have been possibly used to, um, for directional markers um, because you find these ridge top mounds at points um, where the Grand Plaza. Um, and it also mar marks a uh, burial site as well, these ridge top mounds. The mounds were built through a process we call ba simply call basket loading. So the Mississippians would have taken soil from a designated area that on the site we call borrow pit. These blue areas, uh, this is the largest mound, looks mound here. These blue areas <laughs> are borrow pits. So they would have picked, they would have gotten the soil from those borrow pits carried them in the baskets to wherever the mound was being built and dropped those them uh, there. And the reason we are able to determine that is because um, in the early 2000s, Monk's Mound needed some repair work on its east side, and archaeologists went in and cut stair steps to try to, to pack that uh, soil back in. And when they did that, they were able to show the very distinct layers and the different basket loads uh, that were on, put on place. Um, the baskets would have weighed about 50 pounds each. And then this is this is kind of an example similar of what that kind of would have looked like. About that size. Um, I'm now going to go through some of the more prominent features that we have at Cahokia, and I'm also going to take off my jacket because I'm hot. <laughs> Sorry. So Monk's Mound is the largest pre-Columbian earthen man-made structure in the Americas. It uh, stretches at its base about 1,000 feet long, and its uh, uh, base covers about 14 acres. Now, um, one of the cool fun facts about uh, Monk's Mound, so the uh, base of the Great Pyramid of Giza uh, actually only covers 13 acres. So Monk's Mound is a whole acre bigger at its base than the Great Pyramid of Giza. And I'm like, that's fucked, chop that one up for us. <laughs> Um, it does go up in four different terraces, and at its top terrace, it reaches a height of about 100 feet tall. And it's estimated to contain roughly 22 million cubic feet of earth. That's a lot of soil. <laughs> now, um, initially, archaeologists thought that maybe Monk's Mound would have taken 300 years to build, which would have been the span that the Mississippians were at the site. However, Archaeologists have been doing more research, and they've actually taken, and they've done a pouring through the center of Monk's Mound. And what they were able to determine is that Monk's Mound was actually probably um, constructed in about... a big difference from 300 years. It, it changes how we look at the Mississippians socially. So if it was 300 years, then maybe we could look at it and say, well, maybe they just didn't have a big enough population to constantly mound build. 
you know, maybe that's why it took so long. Maybe it wasn't that big of an activity. But if it took only 10 years to build something like that, they must have had the manpower and the, you know, the drive to want to build that mound. All right. Now, less than 1% of the site has been excavated, but the little bit that has been done has told us quite a bit. Um, I showed you the pictures of the stair stepping of Monk's Mound. So also, when they were doing that in the process, they were um, excavating the top of Monk's Mound as well. And what they found was a footprint of a very large Mississippian structure. And uh, it was kind of similar to the footprint that I showed you of the small single-family rectangular dwelling at the beginning. So this one was much bigger than that. It was about 50 feet long and about 50 feet wide on top of Monk's Mound. Now, there is no other structure, there is no evidence of any other structure being that large at Cahokia. So based on that, and based on Monk's Mound's central location on the site, we believe that it would have possibly been used for some type of leadership role. Um, now, what that leadership looked like, we're not entirely sure. Was there one clan? Was it a male and female? We don't actually know. There's not enough archaeological data to say for sure. But we do believe, because of its prominence, that it would have been used for some type of, of leadership role. Um, and then also on top of there, we found that is where we found our Birdman tablet. And um, this, we do believe, tells us a little bit more also about what they might have believed in spiritually. Um, this was found on top of Monk's Mound on the northeast corner by one of our board members, uh, Ken Williams, uh, in the 70s. And it's about the size, and this is just a replica, and it's a little bit smaller than the original, but the original is about the size and thickness of a deck of playing cards. Um, and on the front, it's got this Birdman etching. And again, we believe this symbolizes that belief in a tripartite cosmos with an individual dressed as a bird. So the bird would have symbolized that upper, the individual symbolizing the middle or this world. And then again, on the we back, this symbolizes that belief in a tripartite cosmos with an individual dressed as a bird. So the bird would have symbolized that upper, the individual symbolizing the middle or this world. And then on the back, you've got that what resembles like a snakeskin crotch hatching. And they, they interpret that that would have possibly symboled the, the underworld. Now, we believe that this would have probably been used as some type of um, ceremonial ornament or embellishment of some kind, maybe would have been put on display. Now, right in front of the Monk's Mound is our Grand Plaza area. This is a large rectangular area that covers about 40 to 50 acres. And we believe that this is an area that a lot of community activity took place. And the reason we believe that is because over here in this corner, just out of the picture, there was a, a refuse pit found. And archaeologists said that when they opened that refuse pit, it still had a smell because there was so much stuff in that pit. They said it was almost as if the Mississippians had taken the Grand Plaza and scraped it of everything and made their own landfill. So they, they determined that because of all that there, that there must have been some kind of community activity going on here in this area. There's also evidence that there was a um, center pole in the middle of the Grand Plaza, which again symbolized that maybe that was used for some type of ceremonial event, or maybe even a sporting event. Another cool thing about the Grand Plaza is that it, it looks really flat now. It was not originally that flat when they when the Mississippians would have started. They had to make it that flat themselves by bringing soil from the borrow pits, much like they did with the mounds, to make it that flat. And in some areas, the soil is, in, is about three feet deep that they had to pack it in to make it that flat. One of the events we believe would have taken place in the Grand Plaza area is a game we call Chunky. And it was played with two or more players, You'd have one person throwing a stone, a round stone, and it was kind of concave on the end. This is a smaller one because it's a replica. Um, they would have been a little bit bigger, kind of like a hockey puck. And so you'd have players with spears on either side, and then you'd have the person rolling the stone. They'd roll that stone as hard as they could, like a bowling ball, to get it to go as far as it could, because then you had to try to get as close as you could with your spear to that stone. And whoever was closest, whoever spear was closest to the stone would have been the winner of the game. It's kind of similar to modern day bocce ball, if anyone's familiar with bocce ball. Um, just no hoop. <laughs> There's no hoop. Um, but the reason we know about this is actually um, from, so there's um, 
in the 1500s, um, so a little bit after the Mississippians come, there were Spanish conquistadors that came through the, that came through North America, and um, Hernando de Soto is one of them. And they mentioned they talk about the Natchez tribe, and some archaeologists believe that the Natchez were one of the last surviving Mississippian tribes, and they were playing a version of Chumpy. And so that's where we get a little bit of that interpretation from that. And there are also some more um, the tribes today that do still play the game, such as the Choctaw and the Chickasaw. They still play a version of the game today. We also have the Twin Mounds. Uh, these two are um, just right in line with Monk's Mound and the Grand Plaza area. Now, uh, these two are the second largest on our site, and they have never been excavated. So we actually don't really know what they were used for. So it's just speculation. But based on evidence at uh, other sites, and based on its alignment, we believe that these two together would have been used for some type of mortuary um, activity, where a charnel or a funerary house would have been placed on top of the platform mound, with the burial then taking place in the conical mound next to it. Um, LIDAR technology, it's, um, it's aerial view, and it shows you the rise and depression in the ground. Aerial of uh, that LIDAR shows that there's a pretty extensive causeway going between these two. So there was some kind of activity. Now, we also have evidence that there was a stockade wall that went around Cahokia, but it didn't go around the entire site. It just went around that central part. So the last three things I just talked about, Monk's Mound, Grand Plaza, and the Twin Mounds, they would have been included in the stockade wall. It was roughly built between 1175 and 1275. And that's important because that's roughly after Cahokia hit its peak population. So some things are changing. And Cahokia is not the only place where we see stockade walls starting to come up at Mississippian sites. They're also coming up in Georgia, and they're also coming up in Oklahoma as well. We don't know why, but things are changing. We believe that the wall was built at least four different times, and each time it was rebuilt, it used roughly 15 to 20,000 blocks. That's a lot of materials. It would have stretched from one end to the other about two miles in length. Um, and it would have roughly encompassed about 200 acres, I believe. Now, we weren't really sure what the stockade wall was used for at first, but further investigation shows that at every 90-foot interval, there's a bastion or a watchtower or a guard tower in the wall. Now, if you're taking the resources and the time to put those in your wall, there you're maybe you're protecting yourself from something so that's why we believe that the stockade wall was maybe defensive in nature because of the presence of those bastions or guard towers and not only that but um so there is you can see the different renditions each time based on the footprint each time they rebuilt the wall they included the bastions and guard towers but they also they changed the design and some archaeologists believe that they got more protective over time because by the time you get to this fourth one, they've included uh, L-shaped walls in the front of their entrances to kind of deter their, whoever it is that they're protecting themselves from. And then these are excavations of where you can see the stockade wall and the different bastions that would have come out of that. All right, so this is Mound 72. Mound 72 is one of the six ridgetop mounds that we have at Cahokia. It's unique from the others. All the others are on a north-south, east-west directional facing, except this one. This one is 120 degrees um, diagonal off of north. But it is in line with the winter solstice sunrise and the summer solstice sunset. So we believe that there maybe is some kind of cosmology at play there with um, Mount 72, because it also correlates with our wood hinge that I'm going to talk in the next slide. Now here, this tells us a little bit about um, what the trading network possibly was like at Cahokia. Here we have found a lot of what we call exotic goods, or goods that weren't common to Cahokia. So marine shell and shark's teeth, which we, became, which we believe came from the Gulf Coast of Florida. Um, we've also found copper, which came out of the Great Lakes region, um, and um, mica, which would have came from North Carolina. So we're, we're kind of getting, we don't know exactly who the Mississippians at Cahokia were trading with, but this material that we found it suggests that they were doing some kind of trading. This is the wood hinge that I've been talking about. It's a circular structure. Um, we believe it was used as a sun calendar. So the reconstruction that we have on our site is made with 48 poles with a 410-foot diameter. 
Now, wood hinge was found and uh, discovered in the 70s um, during the same time that they were putting in um, Interstate uh, 5570. Uh, they were trying to put the interstate through some of the site, and they did what they call salvage archaeology. They discovered wood hinge and were actually able to reroute uh, 5570 for that. Um, but they believe it was uh, reconstructed at least five different times, and it would have increased in multiples of 12 each time. And that's where we get the interpretation that it was maybe used as a calendar of some kind with those increases of 12. It, we do uh, believe that it was made out of native red cedar um, because there have, they have been able to find a little bit of remaining wood um, in the postals. Um, and it, it has been red cedar, so we have been trying to put those back in place with our reconstruction. Red cedar would, um, is a natural bug deterrent. Um, it also helps, um, it doesn't rot as well as much either. Um, it's also pretty, you get it all year round. Um, but it also probably would have been um, looked at as a sacred um, uh, tree as well because it would have lived, you know, it was, um, I can't remember, it was the conifers, the, the, the evergreens, they, you know, they, they stay all year round. Um, but it also would have had that red in the inside, the, the red vein of life. Um, we believe that would have been enough for that too. Now, we think that it was a solar calendar too because some of these posts, they actually mark the, sol the, the rising sun of the solstices and the equinoxes. Um, and we actually, it's really cool. So if you're ever at Cahokia around the solstice of the equinox, we're actually getting ready to have our spring equinox um, sunrise observance on March 19th. And um, if you're standing at the center pole and looking east back towards Monk's Mound, it looks like Monk's Mound is releasing the sun or giving birth to the new sun. And that's partially where we get the name for Cahokia City of the Sun. It's really cool. Uh, it's, a, it's a really neat experience if you ever get to check it out. Okay, so um, I do want to talk about our interpretive center uh, a little bit. It was built in uh, 1989, and one of the really neat things that they did uh, before they constructed the building is they actually did some pretty extensive excavations there. They wanted to make sure that the building wasn't going to be destroying anything, they weren't going to be losing anything. So what they ended up finding there was over 100 different pits, uh, 80 to 90 different structures there, and it showed the development of, of a community at Cahokia. So it was like this area was one of those nucleated or you know um, communities that um, in that area, and so you could see how it changed over time. So different co they actually painted on the ground outside, so you could see the footprints of what was there. So it wasn't just forgotten with the concrete. Um, and I think that's pretty important. Now the interpretive center um, right now is closed for a major renovation project. Uh, we've been closed since March of last year. We're impatiently waiting for a reopening, but we, we got a really good grant from the state to do much needed um, updates and repairs to the building. Uh, so far, we've gotten our brand new roof, and we're waiting for the next phase of the project to start, which um, is going to be all in the inside, but it's all going to be mechanical, so electrical, fire security, uh, fire suppression, and all that good stuff. Um, but that's not to say that we're not still moving forward. Um, some things are changing in the gallery. Uh, we are trying to bring a more native voice to our exhibits and to our museum. Uh, we are working very closely with our tribal director, Heather Miller, from the Illinois State Museum. She's really great about getting us contacts and getting us with the right people so we can present the right information. Um, so we're moving forward. Um, Cahokia, when we open in 2020, or we're hoping that we'll open in the mid to end of 2024. Um, they just, they kind of keep pushing us back every, you know, every once in a while, but it's coming up. But we're doing some really awesome things at Cahokia, and one of the things that we've done recently is we've just launched our brand new augmented reality tour at Cahokia. So even though the building is closed, you can still get an immersive experience at Cahokia, um, outside on the grounds. It's our, our augmented reality app, you download it on your phone, and there are markers throughout the site that show you, um, different, um, augmented things of the site. I'll, I'll let the video, the video does a much better job explaining it than I do. Different um, augmented things of the site. I'll, I'll let the video, the video does a much better job explaining it than I do. What if it were possible to travel through time, journey deep into the past, 
discovers secrets of a people long forgotten. Today, that journey awaits you at the Cahokia Mounds World Heritage Site. Through state-of-the-art augmented reality technology, see the world of the ancient Mississippian people and their great city of Cahokia come vividly alive. This unforgettable adventure begins with the Cahokia AR Tour app. It's your passport to a time and place long before Christopher Columbus came to the New World. About 1,000 years ago, the Mississippians built their principal city here, home to as many as 20,000 people. Be amazed as you visit the central ceremonial precinct. Explore towering Monk's Mound, the largest ancient earthwork in the Western Hemisphere. Discover the majesty of the Grand Plaza, place of ritual and pageantry. Experience this ancient world in a powerful new way as augmented reality transports you to mysterious, monumental Cahokia, the city of the sun. So that's our, that's our new project that's come out. Um, if you ever get a chance to check that out, I highly suggest you do that. There are two options. We have our Monk's Mount tour, and we also have the Grand Plaza tour as well. There are different knowledge points, um, and you can also change the, um, the, uh, the reading level if you want middle school, high school, or adult as well. So that's our, that's our new project that's come out. Um, if you ever get a chance to check that out, I highly suggest you do that. There are two options. We have our Monk's Mount tour, and we also have the Grand Plaza tour as well. There are different knowledge points, um, and you can also change the, um, the, uh, the reading level if you want middle school, high school, or adult as well. Now, we are also working, we are trying to work on a new grant now um, with the project, so we're trying to take the project one step further and make it globally, use, globally usable, um, where you could be in a classroom in China and you can use this app to learn about the Hokia Mounds. Because as, as it is right now, it has to, it's, it's tied to the site. So those are some things that are coming in the works uh, for Cahokia Mounds. Now, um, to close it up, uh, we do know that by the year 1300, Cahokia was, was starting to go into decline. And that's because the amount of artifacts from that time period, they really they start getting fewer and fewer. And then by the year 1400, they're hardly finding any artifacts. And that, they're, that to the ar archaeologists, kind of suggests that the site would have been abandoned. Now, we don't actually know for sure what caused the Cahokia, or the Mississippians at Cahokia to go into decline. And we believe that it wasn't necessarily one specific thing that caused them to go into decline, but it was actually probably a multitude of things that were involved. Um, and I always, I'll throw this in too, um, uh, the thing is with archaeologists is um, if you put three archaeologists in a room, you'll get four opinions. So <laughs> I'll, I like to include all the, possible, all the possibilities that are kind of being talked about as of right now. So the first one is that um, it could have been that the Mississippians were depleting their natural resources. So, for example, when they were building their stockade wall, it took anywhere between 15 to 20,000 logs to build, and they did that at least four times. You're not only using wood for that, but you're also using it for your single-family structures, you're using it to build your fire, for, you know, for fishing, for cooking. You're using up a lot of material. So that could have been a factor, and then maybe they needed to start moving out and going farther to find other resources. Well, when you start moving out farther and farther for resources, you might potentially be taking someone else's resources, and there could have been maybe some external conflict at Cahokia, hence the stockade wall. Um, it could have also been possible that the Mississippians had depleted their nutrient-rich soil at Cahokia. So I mentioned that the Mississippians had, they had uh, corn, but there's actually no evidence that they had beans. And if you have corn, you have to have beans or you're not going to, the, the nutrient soil is going to go away. So that could have been a possibility also. Now, some archaeologists like to think that maybe there was a climatic event that caused the Mississippians to decline and move somewhere else. Um, there was a, um, a, a climatic event, the Little Ice Age, that did happen a little bit around the time that the Mississippians were going into decline. But archaeolo some archaeologists don't believe that it really would have had that much of an effect on this area. But I still mention it because it's still being debated. 
And then um, also just simply put, uh, we do know that buffalo or bison hunting was starting to become more popular out in towards the Western Plains around this time getting into there. And it could have been that just like those, um, those cultural phases that I talked about and how those gradually changed over time, it could have been very similar with the Mississippians where they just gradually changed and merged and became something different. Um, and so when I say that they declined, it doesn't mean that they just all die off or that they all disappeared. But because of one reason or another, they were able to reevaluate their situation and Now, if you feel like you have not gotten enough Cahokia mounts from me today, um, I do have a few resources I like to mention. This one is uh, Cahokia Mounts, America's First City. It's written by William uh, Bill Eisminger, and um, he had he's a uh, his whole life has been Cahokia mounts. Um, he started at Cahokia in the 70s um, as an intern and um, after 44 years decided he was going to retire. <laughs> um, but he still comes in every Friday. Um, but he, he's written it in a way that it's not jam-packed full of a lot of archaeological jargon. It's a really great read that anybody could just pick up and, and go with. Um, and it's also a little bit of how I um, uh, modeled my presentation. This is uh, our City of the Sun. Uh, it's kind of like a tour guide. Uh, it takes you through the Interpretive Center. So this is a nice way to kind of supplement the material that you're missing in the Interpretive Center with it being closed right now. Um, it's got a lot of nice color images, and it does. It just kind of goes through the flow of what is in our museum. And then this is for the kiddos. This is Journey to Cahokia. It's an activity book. It's got word searches, crosswords, and all that good stuff in there as well. And if you can't find any of these at your local library, um, you could find these at our website, uh, kahokiemounds.org slash shop. Um, all right. And I th oh, and then too, um, if you want, uh, I do have site literature and things back there on the table, um, site brochures, trail maps. Uh, feel free to help yourself to those. Um, there is a sign-in sheet back there, so if you didn't sign in,